Okay, the recording has started. Jean, take it away. Hello, and welcome to the continuation of our 30-minute CA Workload Automation Tech Talk series. Today, we have Charles Walls, Principal Consultant with CA Technologies. He's going to be discussing how to get the most out of your CA Workload Automation CA7 web client. You can download a copy of the slides for today's presentation on the Workload Automation user community site, uh, either right after the, the call or a little bit later today. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button on your screen, and we'll address questions at the end. Okay, Charles, over to you. Thanks, Jane. So to, um, excuse me. So to, to kind of summarize what, what Jean kind of entered into, what I, we want to go through today is just basically a 30-minute uh, touch point into the CA7 web client. There are several different things that um, we want to make sure that we can you know, pass along to you. Uh, hopefully there are uh, areas that you can jump start into the use of the product uh, and additionally find value maybe that um, you didn't through some of the uh, different commands or, uh, again, reviewing some of the questions I receive from customers. That's kind of really what we want to kind of go through today. So hopefully that will help you, you know, again, get more out of, uh, out of the interface. So let's kind of pass through... Um, you know the uh, you know the uh, legal type stuff, and go into the actual topics that we want to try. Uh, we want to cover today. So, while we visit customers and talk about the web client, I want to capture one of the most common questions that I get from those types of uh, interactions. So, I think that those will be good starting points for us. And then I want to break down a, where we find you know the different pockets of use cases where individuals can find you know, the most value out of, uh, out of the web client. That's by operations monitoring, maybe applications doing some forecasting uh, and administration. And then, of course, the last question that seems to always come back to me is where can I get the, uh, the, the, uh, the download in order to, to implement the web client? So let's just go through those typical um, questions that we, we hear. And first of all, it's comparing the web client with the VTAM interface. We always uh, ask, well, are there things I can do in one that I can't do in the other? Um, how is it secured? What is it that we have to do? Is there any additional uh, administration requirements that I'd have to do to enable individuals to do things in a web client differently than maybe they would have access into the mainframe? Uh, what value? Where can we break this web client down to add the best, uh, the most uh, you know, advanced you know integration and capabilities within the uh, within my organization as far as using the web client. And of course, the last one was where can I find the documentation? These are always, again, upfront typical questions that you know we can get through uh, and get out of the way by simply kind of going through um, you know these steps of let's compare the old uh, with the new. So we find pockets of individuals that are. Um, they're very well versed in how to use the VTAM, the ISPF type interfaces for seven. But we have individuals who may not be so well versed in those types of interfaces, the commands, the structures in which they would need to, ma to navigate around the, the interface. So what I put on the screen is just a basic contrast between the two. It's not uh, leaving or alleviating anything that you can see through VTAM or changing any of the, any of the data wise in the web client, only structuring it so that now things are presented in a color pull-down selection menu, so you can see the contrast in LQ or a let me see all jobs in a uh, an alpha uh, type sequence. You're going to get the same type of data. It's the presentation. It's addressing ease of use. So some of the things that you'll be able to, and we'll talk about through our session today is being able to monitor, go into more in depth than just doing a simple LQ, doing scheduling, administration, calendaring, and generating, and, and show you how the forecasting and flow charts would look. So let's talk simply about the secure. Uh, our customers vary in, in size and, and how they would like to scale the web client. So first of all, the web client sits in a distributed, a server, a web, Tomcat web service that could be, and we'll get into the installation a little bit later, but either on Unix system services or Windows uh, or, or Unix or Linux. Um, the process is as I log in that I'm basically connecting through IP to a host, a system 
uh, task that's running in one of your LPAR environments. And it's at, the, it's at that point that you're validated through ACF2 or Top Secret or, or RACF as to you are an authorized user. So the idea is that there's no uh, profiling, there's no additional security, there's nothing that needs to be set up for individuals who use the web client. It's all being structured through their typical security. If your access, if your access is um, you know allowing administration roles and responsibilities, then that is what you'd be granted as you log in using that mainframe ID and then pass through one or many instances of seven. So it's a one-to-many type of an infrastructure. So once I'm validated, I can simply use DTAM to reach out to one or many systems. So that gives our customers the opportunity to, one, be single prod view uh, within uh, the web client, or maybe include multiple production environments, or maybe production and, and test combinations. So typically when we talk to uh, about the web client, it, it's categorized in what I feel best in, in three different groups. Uh, and, and I kind of put this in the order in which I find most uh, value uh, that the web client can add. The operations application monitoring, you know, some of those individuals responsible in that area, that role, uh, they may have various uh, levels of expertise in, in seven. So bringing ease to use to that group, and I'll show you some examples of how to set filtering, you know, how to bring pull down selection menus to, again, bring ease of use to the whole operational area. Uh, can be a fairly significant value uh, in using the web client. The next area I find that uh, really has a, uh, a lot of traction, and that is presenting the flow charting to the applications group. Those who are responsible, the lines of business responsible for the application, often have very little visibility into how their applications are, in fact, running. Uh, maybe we've produced line item reports and things saying, this is your list of jobs that's going to run on this particular day. Um, but being able to to paint the picture, be able to bring that into a flow chart that's easy to digest uh, is of great value to a lot of applications. So that's another area we typically try to isolate and show uh, value so that they can maybe take advantage of that. And the last area, and we'll talk you know, specifically the areas I feel that scheduling administrators can get value out of the web client. You know, this is often the, the group who have the most experience with seven. They can. They leverage the shortcut commands. They leverage the multi-updates in a single pass. They're very comfortable in their role as being schedulers within seven. Now, that may not be inclusive of all. There could be, and we find this often the case, where we have backups or people who are filling in that role you know, for vacations or whatever reason that the individual who primarily responsible for that is out of the office that day. But typically, that is the group um, that you know, they, they feel very comfortable in the scheduling, but there still is areas of value that I want to bring out in our uh, in later in the slides as to where the administrators can get value out of the web client. So if we kind of break down a little bit of some of the things we just talked about, it, it's changing things from a line item, from a late, from an exception, from a list, to color uh, identifiers. So jobs can be associated with red as being a problematic, uh, those that are uh, in a green state that are uh, in, in a uh, satisfactory, in a, in a good state. Uh, I know the, the particular slide that I have up there is a small, I'm addressing the one on the very left corner, but also within the, 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 the display that you're seeing, there's bars all throughout the, in the, through the display that's indicating the worst case con, you know, condition. So I can see without even scanning through the entire list of jobs that I have a problematic type condition, a red that um, may in, that is going to indicate either I have an ab in, a late to run, or some type of a normal condition. Being able to allow operations or those who are monitoring, when I classify operations, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, what I refer to as frontline defense. It could be now more than uh, that ever line of business that need or would request to see some of their own workload and how it's progressing. Uh, line item displays is sometimes very difficult, as we stated earlier, to digest exactly how all these things would play out in a, in a typical run. Uh, so not only giving them the ability to view in a color representation of the workload, we can also drill in and show active workload, active flow charting of the workload, and see those jobs as they're progressing, 
check being complete successfully uh, in flight or executing those may be that have some abnormal uh, condition with them and interact directly with them to initiate any kind of restart or recovery. The whole process that we typically get into is working with a lot of events. Um, a lot of events meaning that we typically go through sometimes uh, a cycle of looking for the, the air, looking for the needle in the haystack. We sometimes are dependent on lists. We go through a series of excuse and looking for you know things that may be at, uh, not so easily identified as anomaly. Um, the web client again turns that around and gives us the capabilities of setting filters filters so that I can isolate areas that are ones that I may need to pay more attention to. Those filters could be, um, you know, jobs that ab abnormally terminate, those that have maybe a condition error, maybe even jobs that are associated with a server-based application that we want to separate and isolate those from the mainstream, main, uh, uh, the mainstream events so that they're easy for a line of businesses to select and be able to access and do whatever interaction they may need to uh, to do with those. So the whole the idea around segmenting the work so we can monitor by exception, be able to leverage the right mouse click, and we're going to reinforce this. I'm, uh, you know, when I visit and we talk to uh, users around the web client, sometimes I'm, uh, they're, they're very focused on the radio buttons and the different ways of accessing various aspects of the web client. But in each case, the right mouse click provides pull-down methods for the, us to use and execute against uh, the target uh, process that we're looking for, process being a system, you know, a CA7 system or instance name, uh, a job that may be in some abnormal condition as I have in the flow chart. The job has been flagged as an abnormal condition without going any further. I can execute the right mouse click and pull down and view if it's a cross-platform job, the standard error, standard out, right mouse click on the event and initiate a CA11 restart if it's a mainframe event. Um, or post dependencies or add requirements, things of those long lines. So it's fully interactive as far as the things that you can do through the web client as you do today through the VTAM CA7 interface. This is another documentation. Everyone likes to um, have that, co that hard copy that I can mark up, I can read and reference. And so the last slide I have in, in our uh, review today is um, basically talking to the installation. But as we get the product in and, and functional in your environment, the top, and I've got it highlighted, I know it's small, but if you go to help and pull that down, all the online document, documentation there, if you choose to print it off, you can do so, but it's, it's categorized so that it makes it very easy for us, if, for example, looking at the filtering, as I described, on the monitoring by exception, I'm looking for a particular way of identifying those jobs that have a particular admin code, a JCL error, or a condition code. Uh, maybe it's a cross-platform, as my as one, another example I provided. But those types of filtering, there's very specific uh, and detailed documentation on not just describing what it is, but also the steps that you would go through in order to set one of those filters up. Okay, so that kind of sets the stage on some of the things that I typically find. I mean, I believe if I looked at all of them, it's, it's about categorizing those who get the most value out of the web client, starting with the operations, the applications, the line of business, and then you know, into the schedulers. And again, that varies by, uh, by use case. But the last is, again, being able to make sure that you understand where that documentation is because it's very valuable and for, you know, to help you move through the next steps of your implementation of the web client. So let's talk a little bit about the monitoring aspect. So when we talk about those three use cases, talking about operations or the line of business, the monitoring uh, role and responsibility, and then we and we'll move on to the other uh, the other areas. But let's let's look at specifically around the the monitoring. So when I talk about the documentation that helps and could address specifically the steps in setting up a filter, a monitoring a a specific area that's refreshable, meaning that once we establish a container that says, go look at this seven or these instances of CA7 and bring back me any job that 
falls into this filter uh, requirement. That could be, again, HFCL errors, it could be ABNs, whatever, again, the exception is that we're targeting uh, for this particular monitoring uh, container. The, uh, the filtering, you know, as I'm describing that exception, also includes job states. Uh, in, in addition to the exception part of it, maybe I'm looking for jobs that fall into SAP or PeopleSoft or any of the advanced job types that if we're using 7 as a distributed environment uh, enterprise scheduler, that we may want to also isolate. Maybe they're not falling into the category as um, exceptions, but they're still ones we need to bring front and center for you know individuals to be able to see and understand what may be happening within those flows. Looking at the exception list um, that I have in front of you, so this is a representing in red, meaning I'm going after a ab end filter. All the jobs that I brought back into this particular display are indicated by red, so that means they're all bad. Um, so this is just an example of breaking away from the long list of jobs and such that may be in your typical LQ or your list all type displays within the web client isolate those that are ones that we need as an operation or a frontline area of defense need to address and recover from. So this is the short list. It could be a very lengthy list as far as those jobs, hopefully not, but that may be in some problematic state that we need to, to take uh, and address. So one of the things that I find often is that uh, we look for how do we interact with these particular events? What are the shortcuts that allow me to directly influence how and what I may need to do uh, for recovery for these particular events. So that is the example I have on this slide. Right mouse click, you can see, and I know it's small, but right mouse click brings down all the methods where if you would like to you know, do an edit, if you're looking for a QJCL modification to the event, uh, that's available uh, through this pull down. If you're initiating, if it's a mainframe job, a CA11 restart, you'll see a restart. Uh, if, if, in fact, it's a cross-platform, a job that we've enabled uh, to run on a server environment using the new system, a workload system agent 11.3, I would have the ability to retrieve spool uh, back into the web clients for viewing uh, prior to further, you know, resubmit for production or whatever recovery may be through temporary modifications. Again, fully functional, the things that you would expect and, and need to do in the mainframe, they're all uh, would be able to be executed through the web client. Okay, so that's a brief example uh, of the monitoring piece. I picked on ab in abnormal type conditions, but if you look through the doc and you dig a little deeper in the filtering, you'll see that you can look for things like skeletons where we have failed to attach a JCL as, an, as one example, uh, jobs that may be you know in a late to run condition. Another. Uh, good value uh, filter in order to isolate those that may be in, a, in, to, in that condition, that late to run condition. Uh, the idea is to be able to dissect CA7 in a way that we can create these containers that are refreshable. They're not just uh, dependent on anyone to hit the refresh button. They're at an interval that you set so that they're always current uh, with the information that you're asking them to be populated with. So let's shift gears into the um, the next group, the next use case group that we typically uh, we see some uh, some value add. And this is the uh, most often what I find the applications group or the line of business, and I find that often they are creating sometimes their own flow charts. They're doing their own work, but my experience is that they never. Maybe there are some are fairly good in that the applications are static, uh, but my experience is that it's a very it's it's, it's always changing. Uh, type of a landscape that applications vary even if they appear static it's it's Tuesday something typically runs differently than what it runs on Monday and, and, and or Wednesday uh, and different combinations of the day of the week of the month always influence things not a, not even taking into condition a, a change uh, or modification to removing or adding uh, new events to the flow so to address this and what I wanted to, to, to kind of bring across to this is a flow chart when we're talking about uh, potentially hundreds or even more uh, is it can be it can crowd your screen right I mean that's the typical challenge that we always have faced is how do we format a flow chart in, in, in a way that makes it uh, easy for us to, to understand 
so my first thing was let's let's throw up the the, uh, the you know what we would expect. All right, I'm very crowded, very hard for me to see and understand screen. But this is a flow chart representing a huge flow of, of jobs. So the first thing that I, we talk about when we're trying to look and dissect this types of data is first of all you have ways to expand and shrink this display. So in other words, if you want to zoom in and zoom out, that's available. But typically what I recommend is that we take advantage of the search command. So if I'm going to a forecast, and it may be that either I'm being specifically requested to provide something around a particular job. I've made a change to a job. Uh, but I know generally where I'm going. And so search means that it w would give me the opportunity to take uh, to, to take me directly to my, my inquiry, and this is represented by the blue box. So by looking at that, I can zoom in, and I would see within this flow, and there's a legend across the top, I want to leave that, that piece out of it, that would help us identify those jobs and how they're linked together within seven so we can understand all those that are upstream, all those things are downstream from this particular target event, so that you can understand impact or the change, or did I make the change properly in order to reflect the different dependencies as expected on this particular forecasted day. Now the next thing that we can do to further dissect this forecast is that we have the ability to create subfolders, sub-entries, sub-filters in order to take the bigger flow and make smaller, more digestible uh, groupings of, of events. So instead of looking and navigating, it may make sense to say, give me all the jobs that begin with a, a GR or an LG or whatever be the mnemonic naming conventions that would give us you know, a more specific target area that we would like to look at. So you can create one large forecast. The filters give you the opportunity to, to basically create a forecast off 10 different job system name uh, combinations. Uh, we're often targeting specific days, but that also offers you the opportunity to do ranges if you choose. But once the main flow is generated, forecast flow chart is generated, then we can again leverage the right mouse click. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, route mouse click on that generated flow and be able to create those subcategories, those areas that we can create smaller flows off of the, the larger uh, flow chart that we've generated. So let's get to the one of the last uh, topics, uh, and, and we're, we're we're approaching the end of our our session. But this is the the last area around, and this is the scheduling administration. And we talk about you know often those, these roles you know are filled by very experienced individuals who are very uh, comfortable with moving around these the. the um, around the VTAM, the ISPF interface. But there are areas that I think provide significant value in, 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 in supporting of the administration role. And first of all is uh, breaking down the ones and zeros. If you've done, maybe if we're still doing the old assembly and link for your calendars, or maybe we're looking at the schedule maintenance screen and we're looking at the ones and zeros, we're doing the counts. Um, that could be something we're very comfortable with. It could be that it looks, to me, somewhat error prone and that we're counting and we're trying to figure out where days of the, where our, our new year begins and things uh, along those lines. The calendaring that is supported in the web client simplifies that, meaning that it displays everything in a six-month calendar where we can have and use select pull-down menus to say every Monday through Friday is on. Um, so we don't have to go through and figure out what is a Monday, what is a, you know, where does this calendar begin? It's, it's Workday, it's a standard WD calendar. Let's make it so with one entry and save it as my scale, um, you know, 17 WD, and we're, we're, we're done as a, an example of an exercise. And if we have more specific uh, calendaring around special use cases or things along those lines, the, the blues, in this case, it's a simple Monday calendar I have in my example, but uh, each day that I can, I can click on with a mouse uh, becomes a, a work day. So um, ease of use creating Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, Monday through Sunday calendars, uh, or again, clicking through or defining ranges as to where maybe cyclic or, or cycle type processing may apply. Uh, all those are making, uh, addressing ease of use for creating, uh, creating the calendars. And the last 
to kind of wrap up the schedule administration areas that I feel that it also adds value would be cross-platform. I know we've talked a little bit around the extendability of 7 as an enterprise solution and the ability to go in through the web client and isolate maybe by filtering exceptions that might be appropriate for, you know, any of the advanced job types, a Windows job or Unix job or SAP or whatever, any of the other different use cases that you have in, in play for the agents. But also with that comes the parameters necessary to drive that work. And they're not all just as simple as a JCL or thing, a unit of work that we are accustomed to in the, in the mainframe. They often require different PARMs and things to be associated with that executable to, say, an SAP or to a PeopleSoft or Oracle, any of those number of other job types we've kind of run through. Well, the web client offers a forms editor, so it means that from a scheduler, as I feel I am, uh, I can basically be uh, you know, comfortable in my, I can schedule a job, control the dependencies, and what to do if, in fact, we have some type of anomaly or problem. But the actual fill-in-the-blank process of what to do is this specialized job uh, types, uh, I can use the form editor to present me with a basic fill-in-the-blank type process of defining those. So I no longer have to be so, um, you know, so well-versed in what is an argument, what is a parameter that's specific only to a PeopleSoft or uh, to any other of the different job type, file monitoring, FTP, and such. And one last thing to go about, uh, you know, a little beyond the, you know, definition process for the cross-platform. If you do any interaction with ARF or with resource with with VRM, those are all built into it as well. So if you've gone through the ARF set uh, setup, you know, it, it kind of leads you through multiple la layers of screens. Um, the layout for that top, same type of update and edit. Uh, is much more straightforward than a web client. Things and options that you would typically have to fill in those values in VTAM ISPF become pull down selection items. Again, simplifying, addressing ease of use uh, for how we would go about defining those processes. So, the last question before we, uh, last, excuse me, the last uh, slide before we go into questions before we close is. Um, where do we get the download? And so often we ask, why is it in the common download set? Uh, if you went to support by product and the support.com, uh, selecting CA workload automation, CA7 edition, uh, over on the far right, you see I have it highlighted in yellow, popular links. Um, and that would be where you pull down and give you all the available uh, uh, OS uh, systems that the web client supports, as well as installation documents. So this is the time. I know we're right at the bottom of the hour, um, a half hour. Um, but these are areas that you can find some additional documentation in docops.ca.com, uh, interface guide, uh, as well as the implementation guide that uh, is part of that document set from where you would find the downloads off the, the main products or by product page, communities. Um, and we can definitely, again, post those questions back to you um, either you know, as part of the session or in a follow-up. Thanks, Charles. So if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A panel on your screen. Uh, while we're waiting for some questions to queue up here, uh, if you can move to the next slide, Charles, I'd like to remind our listeners of the call for speakers for CA World, which is November in uh, Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. Um, we are still uh, open to additional speakers for workload automation at CA World. So if you're interested in speaking, uh, go ahead and send, can you advance to the next slide there? Go ahead and uh, send me an email, Gene Rissmiller, gene.rissmiller at ca.com, and we will take your submissions through the middle of July. All right, so let's see if we have any uh, questions yep. that have come in yet. Yep, let me see one. It, um, okay. the, the question is, my understanding is a flow view does not have the ability to do single point of view for multiple instances of those CA7 instances on different SysPlex. That a separate JFM task is required on each SysPlex. Um, that is true. You know, so what I showed in the flow chart was a basically a forecast, so it was something that we can point to each one of those individual systems 
and bring back a forecast so that we can see that, but that's not real time. The JFM piece is there only to give us the real time flow chart. So that is where one of the earlier slides, the right mouse click and initiating restart, recovery, and those kind of actions. So yes, in, in those cases it may break down for, by security, um, but that would be uh, that would be a barrier. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, okay, the rest of them are the, the, the presentation. I think, Jane, you answered it mm -hmm. will be made available. Right, right. It will be posted on the Workload Automation user community site uh, either shortly after this uh, call or within, uh, within 24 hours for sure. I also want to let our listeners know that at CA World this year, uh, in November, we have over 30 pre-conference education sessions that we're bringing to you. This year at CA World, we have changed the format of the conference to be the educational type conference that we've all known and love over the years. So therefore, we're bringing you over 30 different workload automation specific uh, pre-conference education sessions. We have three dedicated rooms for workload automation, so be looking for a schedule that will be published on July 1st on the CA World website. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. Several courses that we'll be delivering for CA7 uh, and the other uh, workload automation engines. Okay. You see any more questions out there, Charles? Um, I, I don't. Okay. Well, very good. Hold on, hold on guys. There are a couple more questions. Okay. Um, there's there's one. Um, are you able to do a live demonstration of this? Are there any concerns with the new R12 release okay. for this? Uh, yes and no. Yes, I can do a live demo anytime, and no, there's no. Um, um, you know, it, it is fully functional with CA7 R12. You would have to add in one of the uh, because R12 is Datacom. Um, in the spawn processes, it actually give you the connectivity over to 7, you'd have to add your uh, your DB PARMS parameter so that it would know a little bit about your R12 environment, uh, but you can mix and match. So uh, it is fully functional with R12. And then the other question is, what is the max users recommended for CA web client? Do they all have to have a CA main, CA7 mainframe logon? That's a, that is another good, very good question, and we find a very a mix. So. First of all, to address the, the um, who can access, there is a facility parameter that you can put in play to restrict who can get into the web client, even if they have a mainframe login ID and password. So you have some process to control who can come in. You can also control a, a count. In other words, how many are it in, in, in flight at any given time. But most often what, ha what we see is the, the scheduler, those who have active roles within the monitoring and administration, they have their own IDs, and, and that's kind of where the use case comes in. Those that may have the or the line of businesses or the application, they may have already a generic or you have a, a generic ID that has, you know, basically list-only type access. And so for that, that gains them sufficient authority to be able to, um, you know, view the forecasted flow charts. And, and you can also even segment that out from uh, from the rest of the groups if you want to isolate those individuals to uh, for that level of access. All right, thanks. I don't see any other questions, um, so I guess we can wrap up. And as Gene said, I will post this replay and the uh, presentation out in the community probably later today. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everyone. This ends today's call.